Convoyage, his greatest achievement. Then you'll see the South Pole where they went. Um, let me give you a few details of this because it's remarkable. They crossed the Antarctic Circle on the 17th of January 1773 within their first European ship to do so. They entered May's back at Queen Charlotte Sound in New Zealand. 26th of August 1773 is in Tahiti. The 20th of December, they're back in the Arctic Circle and they're in and out till February 1774. There's talk of ice on the sails and they back the sails, put the helm hard over, force the whole vessel to shake, to crack the ice off the sails so it will fall to the deck and shake the snow off the yards. And the men are in woolen jerkins because that's all they had. Some of them were short sleeved. Cook uh, got the tailors on the ship to make some of them long sleeved and apparently they didn't complain much after that. Anyone been to the Antarctic? I mean, wow. I have, and I had my Gore-Tex, and I was coast, but just remarkable. Anyway, um, on the 30th of January, 1774, he reaches 71 degrees 10 minutes south. That's a record that stood for 49 years. 250 years ago. On the 6th of February, 1774, in his logbook, he quotes, the southern continent, and it talks about the pe that people have written about for a whole long, years and years and years, a southern continent is now entirely refuted. Now, again, important to realise Australia, knowing the east coast was there, knowing the west coast and not knowing whether they were linked or whether they were islands or whether it was a big bay in the middle. That wasn't the southern, great southern continent. The great southern continent was a land mass equal to the one in the north because the world would tip over otherwise. And that had been talked about for thousands of years. And Cook was able to refute that quite clearly after this voyage. So, I mean, as a card carrying Anglo-Saxon origin, Australian, to say that the second voyage was the most important, um, rankles a bit, but it's probably true. What, what they found and what they're able to prove and clarify and, and, and augment the maps of the Southern Pacific um, was, was a, a remarkable achievement. And plus, he meant, as those other places I say, the South Georgia and all those sorts of islands, there's South Georgia there. Um, Remarkable, remarkable. The third voyage. Cook wasn't offered the third voyage. He was made post captain and sent to, well, he was offered the privilege as a second or third captain at Greenwich Hospital, um, you know, the, um, the pensioners place, because the Admiralty thought he'd done his job and they were really happy. Um, that, that wasn't Cook's idea. He didn't like admis, admin. Um, he put his name forward, he had meetings with Palliser, he had meetings with the first Sea Lord, Lord Sandwich, he had meetings with the Secretary of the, of the Admiralty um, and said, I want this. And they said, fine, the whole thing was sorted out in, in, in a matter of days, not months. He used the resolution again and another ship called the Discovery. The goal was to do in the North Pacific what they had done in the South Pacific. They sailed in June 1776. Cook is now 48 years old. The Northwest Passage was a big reward. There was twenty thousand pounds offered to the captain of the ship who could sail within one degree, I think it was, of the North Pole. Now Cook didn't believe in the Great Southern Continent. Why would he believe in the Northwest Passage? But A, the money was important, and B, if he was successful, this is his one chance to become a gentleman. And if I hark back to Big Beagle Hall described um Describe Cook as chillingly ambitious. Now, in that context, maybe that's why he decided he would do it. So, they um, went to sea. The resolution was a tired ship. The dockyards were highly corrupt. Palliser was in charge, and it wasn't done as it should have been. Um, the European nations were suspicious. They thought it was a British land grab. Interestingly, they got support from Ben Franklin who gave uh, a, pass a, a passport to Cook and instructed all um, American warships to not consider her an enemy, nor suffer any plunder to be made of the effects contained in her, etc., etc. Don't send her any other port, um, but you're to treat said Captain Cook and his people with all civility and kindness as common friends to mankind. Uh, unfortunately, Cook was dead by the time that was written, but Ben Franklin didn't know that. Um, he is a little difficult, a bit more erratic this time. He's using the Lashmore. Um, 
the officers are starting to worry about some of his judgment calls. Was he sick? Was he a control freak? Was he simply too old? All of the above, I, I, no one knows. Um, but people were starting to get a little concerned. Um, he had his master's mate on this trip, one William Bly, who he encouraged and helped. Bly had already proven himself unpopular with the ship's company, um, and that's a subject of a whole other members talk that you might listen to one day. Also on board was George Vancouver, um, of Vancouver Island fame. So, this third voyage. Oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, the, the blue is after Cook's death. That was what the ship continued to do after um, the passing of Cook. So, third voyage. Some dates for you, they left June, July. Depends whether you say left the UK or left Spithead or wherever they left from. On the 25th of December, 1776, they're at Christmas Bay in the Craigalloon Group. They stopped in Tasmania at Adventure Bay to water. Um, ironically, on the 26th of January, 1777. The 12th of February, they were at Queen Charlotte Sound in New Zealand again. He would always go to Queen Charlotte Sound. He would always go to Amateba Bay in um, Tahiti. He went to Tonga in April. In August, he was in Tahiti. On the 20th of January 1778, he was in Hawaii. They left Hawaii on the 2nd of February 1778. By the 30th of March, they were at Vancouver Island. The 12th of May, they were at Prince William Sound. In August, they crossed the Bering Sea. By the 18th of August, they had reached 70 degrees 44 minutes north, but then they were stopped by ice. And you can see that's up in here. Um, on the 17th of January, they went back to Hawaii to, and forgive my Hawaiian pronunciation, Kealakua Bay, um, and on the 14th of February the worst happened, on the 7th of October the ships were back in the UK. So, the Sandwich Islands. From a European perspective, Cook discovered, was the first European to see the Sandwich Islands, which of course is Hawaii, um, and thought he knew it as people well. The ship needed repairs, they worked quite happily with the local people. Um, it was really badly fitted out in Brisbane, in, Brisbane, in Britain, as I said. Um, and Cook wrote a letter to Palliser complaining about how corrupt it was and how badly it was done. I said before in Tahiti that Cook abstained from the opportunity of taking favours with the local women. Um, only gods did that in this sort of culture. and. Cook was regarded as having some association with the god of peace and fertility, whose name was Lona, uh, because only gods did the sort of things that he did. Um, meanwhile, of course, Cook's ships are a drain on local supplies. A lot of these cultures were smart enough to take what they needed today. But Cook took what he needed for the next six or 12 months. And the people, people simply didn't understand that, and they have every reason to be right but they didn't know where Cook was going what he was doing. So, they were drained local the supplies. The chief, Kalanaiopu, uh, wants them gone, but it's the time of worshipping Luna, Luna, not Ku, the god of war, but the time of Ku is coming up. So, they leave the bay. But as I said before, they had some exploration, they had to come back. They needed somewhere warm and safe, so they came back. Um, it's not working very well. The main mast is so rotten. So they set up camp uh, to, to fix these things. Um, the chief's not happy. It's the time for coup, the god of war. Um, they trade with the Hawaiians. Uh, an iron nail is the, is the currency de rigueur. Um, eventually, something really serious happens. And that is that the cutter is taken. The cutter is taken and the cutter being a small ship, a small boat, uh, and it's taken and broken up for the iron nails. Um, now, unbeknownst to the local people, they were going to do the Northwest Passage and look for it, and the cutter was really important. Up in that northern part of um, Bering Sea there, it's really, really shallow. So what would happen is the cutters would go out in front of the ships, take the soundings, and then say, yes, this way, that way, to lead them through. So without that, they were doomed. Uh, to do their, that, that mission. They would sink the cutter almost down to the gunnels to keep it wet so the sun wouldn't dry it out and cause it to split. So the cutter swam ashore, broken up. Um, 
and that causes trouble. So, Cook decides to blockade the bay and to keep other groups of local people out and to secretly arrest the chief and ransom him back to get the cutter back. He doesn't know he's been broken up. So he split his forces and he goes ashore uh, with a weapon and a few marines and the others are in boats nearby. He finds the chief and he tries to bring him to the ship to ransom him for the cutter. <coughs> the chief's wife begs him, the chief not to go because she thinks Cook is going to kill him, which wasn't his plan, but nonetheless, she obviously didn't know that. Um, a group of gathers and sub-chiefs say the same thing, don't go. So a literal tug of war in shoes of this poor man. Tension rise and Cook is hit on the face with a rock. He fires his weapon at the assailant, but the assailant's war mat, which is a woven mat, stops the bullet. And the, the, the local people's awe of, of the military technology starting to wane as misfires and all those sorts of things. So he stops the, the bullet um, and then all hell breaks loose. The Hawaiians move in, the Marines fire a volley into their shame, drop them rifles and run away to, and they leave Cook and a few Marines ashore. Um, Cook is struck in the back of the head with a club as he's facing the, the bay, calling for Williamson, one of his lieutenants, to come and get him in the longboat. Longboat, come and get me, come and get me. Williamson, uh uh, no way, too scary. Williamson was later charged with cowardice at the Battle of Copenhagen, and Nelson wanted him shot on the spot, like bum, just shoot him. Uh, he wasn't shot, he was uh, cashiered from the, from the Navy in disgrace. However, it was the wrong man to come and rescue him. Cook stabbed again, he falls, and, and he's hacked to bits. Um, his body is then shared out with the people, not for eating or anything, they wanted his mana, his aura, because he was such an important figure. Um, Clerk, who's a clerk, who's the captain of the Discovery, the second ship, oh, sorry, this thing takes about 10 minutes and four Marines are killed, I shouldn't we'll forget him. The captain of the Discovery is now in charge, he decides against reprisals, he wants to try and normalise relationship. They want the bits they can get a book back for burial. They eventually, he's killed on the 14th, um, and they got the long bones back on the 20th. He was 50 years old and, and, and four months at the time he was buried at sea. The sailors immediately forgot their frustrations with him and um, lionised him, which I suppose you can understand from their point of view. Um, and the reason they got the bits of cook back that they did was that they, it was felt that the Hawaiians were an entire fleet of British ships would come. So there's a painting by a Dutch guy. There's a, um, a, a painting by a British, I forget which one that was. Forgive me. Anyway, um, there it is. Um, however, um, that's probably not how it happened. That's, um, but the fact Cook is no more was Palliser or one of the El Corville saying, what a shame that he had gone because there was, was lots they could still have him do. However, this is more like it. This is a painting by a fellow by the name of Herb Cain. And Herb Cain um, is a, an Hawaiian artist. No, I can't find it here, oh dear. Um, he's a Hawaiian artist and he went back into the annals to find out what the tide was like on the day, what time of day it was. And so he got the weather, the, the sun, the shadows, um, and you can see it's on the lava. Uh, Cook is wearing his canvas day clothes, not his dress clothes as we saw in this picture here. Um, and the geologists had told Herb that the ground had subsided 600 millimetres in the last 250 years. So he went swimming to map the topography so he could get it right. Um, and, and indeed, the, and the feather coat on the chief, all these things appear to be as accurate as you can possibly get them. So if we are to not rely on that and not rely on that, we want to imagine what it was like. That's what it was like. And uh, that's the spot in the bay where he was, um, was killed. And for those of you that travel to the US and like to win a bet, it's always fun to tell the Americans that there is an American state flag that has the Union Jack on it. And it's the Hawaiian state flag. And that's worth a few beers, I can assure you. <laughs> so, Cook is no more. Let's talk about Elizabeth. 
13 years younger. She lived to be 93 years old and she outlived her six children. What a tragedy. They were married on the 21st of December, 1766 at St Margaret's in Barking. She had six children by cook. She left him pregnant every time we went to sea. Which we probably didn't endear her when she was always away for two years and three years. She outlived all her six children. What a tragedy. And just before she died, she burnt every one of the papers that she had to cook. They were her papers, and that was the great person. But she chose to burn them rather than leave them for posterity. It's clearly her decision, but gee, that would have been interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Huh. Six children. James died at sea with the Royal Navy at 31. Nathaniel at sea with the Royal Navy at 16. Elizabeth at five, Joseph as a baby, George as a baby, Hugh got a disease at Cambridge and died at 17. There are no direct children of James Cook. Wow. You'll read he's got, you know, um, bastards scattered through Polynesia and Melanesia. Not true, not true. There are no direct descendants of James Cook. Uh, look, I will fly through this. Um, there are so many things called after him. There's the Cook Islands, the country subdivisions. There are towns. Uh, there are geographic features in, the, in Antarctica, French Polynesia, etc., etc. Canada, um, more geographic features. A crater on the moon. Mm -hmm. um, so, the world's greatest explorer? Possibly. He was competent and capable in <clears throat> high latitudes, in the tropics, coastal sailing, deep ocean sailing. He sailed something like 200,000 nautical miles. That's roughly the distance to the moon. He could handle latitudes, as I say, deep ocean, shallow. He was the consummate professional sailor. The Admiralty always regarded him as, as gifted. Um, he discovered the first European to see uh, the New Hebrides, New Caledonia, Hawaii. He charted New Zealand. He charted the east coast of Australia. Um, he was remarkable in terms of his seafaring skills, um, his cartographic skills, and his navigation skills. Was he flawed? Yeah, we're all flawed. He was gifted, he was ambitious, he was etc, etc, etc. Was he too old? Um, I don't know, make your own mind up. He was only 48 when he left. Um, but that's what people think. Up to you. And uh, I couldn't resist it. the highest accolade of all. That's the Space Shuttle Endeavour. Hmm. And there's a quick timeline again, we've talked through those. So. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't bored you. I hope you've learned something about what I think is probably fair to say the world's greatest explorer. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Sir.